Are you tired of waking up with worry, with anxiety, with knots in your stomach? Has the enemy's voice been the first thing you hear when you get out of bed? The enemy is telling you you're not going to make it, telling you that it's going to be a hard day, telling you that there's no use of even trying, that you're not good enough. Isn't it exhausting to begin day after day with these discouraging thoughts? Child of God, it's time to change your story. You have to choose to begin your day differently. It's going to be up to you to choose that voice you listen to when starting your day. It's time to wake up every morning with a, good morning, Jesus. It's time to start your day with good thoughts, godly thoughts, and godly thoughts will build you up for your day. You'll be able to face anything. If you failed yesterday, begin today with God. You'll be amazed at how you'll get this hope inside and you'll know that today is a new day and as long as you have God with you, it's another chance to overcome failure or defeat. Start your day by saying, today I have a new chance to win, to succeed where I didn't yesterday. Face your day with confidence because you have God's grace to strengthen you. Today, God's mercies for you are new. He's rooting for you. You see you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. It's time to get up and be who you were made to be. And you were made to be victorious. What does God say about you in his word? He calls you his own. You don't belong to the devil. You belong to God. So listen to the voice of God, not to the voice of the enemy. God is your father. The maker of the universe calls you his child. You are a child of the king. So go into your day with authority and confidence. You are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. The word of God says that the Lord is your shepherd and you shall not want. That means that when you let God direct your day, direct your decisions, direct your steps, you shall not want. He will make sure you're satisfied. He will lead you to green pastures, and though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with you. His rod and his staff will comfort you. Friends, we need to let God be the author of our story. God has promised that surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. And what shall separate you from the love of God? Nothing, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Nothing will separate you from his love. Start your day with the author of your life. Start your day with the one who has the key to your future, to the one who made you, the one who will never leave you. Like the psalmist in Psalms 143.8, make this your prayer. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. The moment you wake up, know that God is with you no matter what that there is nothing you can do to make God leave you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Wake up knowing you're under the shadow of the wings of a mighty God. He calls you blessed in the city and blessed in the countryside. He says you're the head and not the tail. Don't waste your day on thoughts that are not even true. When you start your day thinking about yesterday's failures, embarrassing moments, challenges, you're going to waste your day. You're going to waste your day worrying about things you cannot change instead of giving them to him with whom nothing is impossible. Matthew 6:27. which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? You add nothing to your life by being anxious and worrying about that situation. Instead, you take away from your life when you dwell on those negative thoughts. It will sap your energy, your joy, and your peace. Stop wasting your days with ungodly thoughts. 
This is the day the Lord has made. Make a choice to rejoice and be glad in it because every day counts. The fact that you're alive today means the Lord is not done with you yet. He has a lot in store for you. But you have to get up with the attitude of a soldier and fight for what is yours. Fight off the enemy's thoughts and fight to keep God's thoughts. Start your day by fighting for what is yours. How? By prayer. By reading God's words. By getting to know what God says about you and your situation. Speak the word of God over your life, over your job, over your children, over everything. It's not time to fold up and cry. It's time to get up and fight. When today is gone, it won't come back. So make today count. Live today like it was your last day on earth. Make today count for the kingdom of God. You see, when you win, you bring glory to God. When you succeed, God is exalted in that success. When you have joy, despite your circumstances, people will be attracted to you and your God. But if you walk around feeling and looking and sounding defeated, what kind of testimony is that to those around you? At the end of the day, you want your life to be a living testimony of what God is doing in your life. Let your life count for God's kingdom. So when you wake up in the morning, wake up knowing you're on assignment. The Lord has given you light so you can make a difference for His kingdom. Ask yourself, who can I be a blessing to today? Who can I pray for today? Can I check on my neighbor? What difference can I make in the kingdom of God today? When you start to think of what you can do for others and how God can use you, you stop feeling defeated. Self-pity begins to disappear. You begin to feel empowered. You start to see yourself as an agent of heaven and not a victim of the enemy. And this is so important because, as the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What you think about yourself is important. It has an impact on how you feel about facing your day, facing your enemy, facing your giant. King David Though a young boy was not scared of the giant Goliath because he knew that they were God's chosen people, Josiah and Caleb saw the enemies in the land and were not intimidated. It's recorded in Numbers 13.30. When Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. He had no doubt in his mind that God had given them the power to overcome. They saw themselves as winners. When you remind yourself who you are, you begin your day at a point of victory. And you know Jeremiah 29 11, God has good thoughts towards you. It's time for you to have good thoughts about yourself. Stop thinking about how good things never happen to you. Turn it around and say, despite all those things that have happened to me, I've made it through. Despite my circumstances, I'm still here. God must love me so much that he has not let life consume me. God has told you who you are in his world. Will you believe his word or believe what's happening around you? When you wake up in the world and negative thoughts flood your mind, you need to overpower them with godly music. Change them with the word of God. Drown them with prayer. Speak over those thoughts using the word of God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Proverbs 18.21 The power of life and death is in your tongue. You have the power to change your environment, your life, your destiny, by what you speak. Don't say, I'll never make it. It's impossible. There's no way. Instead, proclaim God's word. He makes a way where there seems to be no way. He makes all things work out for my good. Nothing is impossible for my God. If God is for you, who can be against you? There are thousands of scriptures for us to apply to all those kinds of situations. 
we need to memorize them and speak them over our lives. Many times the devil lies to us because we don't know the word of God. Even when we go through hard times, we will be at peace. 2 Corinthians 12.10 Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When we know his word, we are strengthened inside. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If you lack wisdom, ask him for it. God says in James 1, 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all those finding fault, and it will be given to you. God is able when you're not able. Don't let the enemy lie to you. As you begin your day, you also have to realize that the battle belongs to God. That when all is said and done, the Lord will fight for your battles. All you have to do is show up. Show up to work, show up to Bible study, show up to school, and see the salvation of the Lord. In fact, you might as well start your day by praising God with an attitude of gratitude because the Lord has already gone before you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And not everything will work out the way you expected, because God's ways are not ours. We can only see this moment, but God sees the end from the beginning. You may have lost that job. You may have lost that project. You may have lost that friendship. In all things, keep praying. Keep praising. Keep giving God thanks. Why? Because that's God's will for us. You see, God knows what he is doing in your life, and all he's doing is for your good. As difficult as it may seem, give him thanks. Begin your day by giving him thanks. Thank him for life, for family, for health. Thank God for his word. Thank God for the blood of Jesus that covers you and washes you of all your sins. Start your day with an attitude of gratitude. Don't try and understand everything or make sense of everything that is happening. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Proverbs 3, 5-6 through 6. Lean on Him. Let God be the first thought you have when you wake up. Before you do anything else, put Him first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. The Bible says Jesus is the prototype of the new creature. Jesus is our model our example, and he has laid the right example for us. He woke up in the morning and went to pray, very early in the morning. Mornings are for us to refresh our energy, strength, and get ready for the day's tasks. How better do we refresh our energy if not in a fellowship with our Creator? God wants us to fellowship with Him. He wants us to revere Him above anything else. He wants us to worship Him with all our hearts. Why? Because that's the best thing for us. When we do so, we set ourselves up for the best day. We prepare ourselves for success, for the best opportunities, for greater things that are beyond our wildest imagination. We must learn to worship God first in the morning immediately after we wake. This is how you commit your day, home, work, 
studies, spouse, kids, projects, family, boss, colleagues, staff, business, goals, plans, and every other thing into God's hands. The Bible says to cast your cares on the Lord, for He cares for you. God cares for you. He wants the best for you. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to become the best version of yourself, to achieve your goals, live your dreams, fulfill your destiny. God wants the ultimate best for you. He wants you to fulfill your purpose. He also wants you to live for Him. When you commit all your affairs in God's care early in the morning before going out, you set yourself up for ultimate success throughout that day. Things begin to work out in your favor. Even when things go the other way, you are not moved. Why? Because you know that God's got your back. He's on the wheel. There might be a few bumps here and there, but God's the one driving your vehicle. You cannot fall. A thousand might fall at your right and 10,000 at your left, but they will not come near you, says the Lord of the host. A day in the Lord's care is the best day ever. A day in Him is the best day ever. Commit your day to Him. Wake up and rest in His loving arms. Put all your burdens, all your affairs, all of you in His care and go out in victory because you are a victor already. Whatever comes at you during the day, whatever comes at you at work, at school, or wherever you go, you have the assurance of the Holy Spirit that you are a winner. Yes, you are a winner. Let God guide your steps. Let Him order your journey. Let Him guide you through it all. Jesus recorded a huge amount of victory in God's work because every day He wakes up in the morning and set apart some time to have a conversation with the Father. Weeping may come at night, but joy comes in the morning. No matter how bad the previous day was, joy comes in the morning. You know what else that verse meant? The actual morning is in God. The night is the world. Jesus said, in the world you have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He said in me, you will have peace. The world is full of many things that can discourage us, sadden us, embarrass us, frighten us, worry, and make us weep. So when the Bible says weeping may come at night, the night is the world. The cares of the world. The morning is God. Joy is in God. In the kingdom of God, there is peace, righteousness, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy is a reality of God's kingdom, not the world. Joy is in God Himself. And every morning when you wake up, you will do yourself the best thing by tapping from that abundance of joy. Drink from the reservoir of God's joy. Pour yourself, fill yourself with the joy of the Lord. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in what God has done. Rejoice in what God will do for you that day. Rejoice for what God is doing. Rejoice for the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Let the aura of God's presence permeate your daily affairs and experience the victory of God in all that you lay your hands on each day. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Psalm 143, verse 8. The psalmist understood the importance of mornings. He also understood the relevance of committing your day to God in the morning. He said, show me the way I should go. Show me what I should do today. Guide me. Give me wisdom to talk, to act, to do thy will, O Lord. 
This is not to say that when you wake up in the morning and doing something else asides from praying or studying God's Word is bad. No, it isn't. But committing your day to God as you wake up is simply the best. That's all. It's best for your mind, for your day, for your work, and whatever else you will do the rest of the day. God is the best keeper of your life. When you entrust your life in God's hands, you can be sure that you're forever secured in His arms. Wake up in God. Wake up with God. His faithfulness is new every morning. Every morning is a fresh start in our lives. Mornings are wonderful. Waking up in the morning is an opportunity to thank the Lord. Now, imagine if you filled your morning with God. Could the rest of your day look different? Could your mind be renewed with peace, joy, and hope instead of comparison, anger, or stress? Spending time with God and in His Word can put everything in perspective. Your soul will be filled, your mindset renewed, and your stress can be replaced with His peace. Your morning routine can be an easy thing to overlook, neglect, or underestimate. The good news is that you have the power to choose to be intentional with your time. Make your time with God a priority, and you can make a start by changing your morning routine. It's all about priority, the first thing in your heart. Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. All other things will be added unto you. Seek the kingdom of God first. Put God first in all your affairs. Every day, in the morning, before going out, put God first. Put him first. Let him take charge. Starting your day with God also makes a statement. It says that you put him first and he is a priority in your life. Whenever you spend time with God, it's always valuable, precious, and important. Don't start your day with life's demands. Instead, surrender to the one who has created you and all that you see. Make sure that God is the focus of your morning. That way, he will be on your mind all day. When it comes to everyday life, it can be pretty hectic and busy. You have so much to do and so much on your mind that it can be easy to put spending time with God on the back burner. This week, spend time with Him in prayer. Spend time with the scriptures too. Look for ways that He is working in your life throughout your day. David was a man of worship. He understood what it means to spend more time in God's loving presence. He said, I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him, my heart trusts. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. You know what God called David? a man after my own heart. That was David. That can be you too. When you fellowship daily with God, you put on the whole armor of God. Your mind becomes the mind of Christ. Your mind becomes solidified in what God has said about you. Your spirit, soul, and body are filled with the aura of God's presence. You exude blessings, good things, God's favor to everyone and everything around you. Nothing can stop you. No challenges can stop you. Hate, malice, bad, bad things cannot stop you. Sin cannot stop you. Anger cannot stop you. You experience the abundant mercy, joy, grace, 
faithfulness of God in its reality. God's blessings become your reality. It becomes what you experience beyond knowledge. Dear brother, dear sister, wake up to God's plan. Wake up to God's abundant blessings. Wake up giving expression to God's love to everyone and everything around you. For you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill. You are the salt of the earth. You are God's heritage. Show him forth in all that you do. Let his loving kindness permeate all that you do. Let it flow in your relationships, in your affairs, in your present and future. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Give God the chance in your life, not just by mouth, but by your actions. God told Joshua, meditate on the word day and night that you may have good success. He said good success. So there is a success that is good. There is the different kind of success which is good. And that is the success that emanates from God. A kind of success that is more virtuous than any other kind of success. And how do you have that kind of success? When you meditate on his word day and night. The psalmist said, your word is a lamp unto my feet. Psalms 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. It did not say blessed is the one who does not sin, but the one who is not influenced by the wicked. How you shield yourself from the influence of the wicked, sinners, is by meditating on his word. And that person will be fruitful, like a tree planted by the riverside. God said, be fruitful and multiply. This is not just about procreation. It also applies to your life, your affairs. His command is for you to be fruitful and multiply. As you go out this week, be fruitful and multiply. Multiply, increase, be fruitful. That is God's agenda for you, to be fruitful. And remember this also, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You've been praying for a miracle, a breakthrough. Your loved one is sick. Your finances are in shambles. Your marriage is crumbling. As the clock is ticking, you're getting more desperate. You're praying for God to send you help now, not tomorrow, but now. But heaven seems silent. You feel like giving up. It seems like it's all over for you. It's in these difficult moments, the Bible gives us the most unexpected instructions. Give thanks in advance. As you wait, give thanks. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Bible tells us to give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's will for you is that in this time of uncertainty and even doubt, where you may feel like you won't make it through, that you will give thanks to Him. We need to give thanks when it doesn't look like anything is changing. You might ask, even though my child is still sick? And the answer is yes. By faith, give thanks for the healing that is coming. Even though I don't have food on my table, yes, give thanks for the Lord shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Even when I've been praying to have a child for years and the doctors are not hopeful for me? Yes, give thanks for the fruit of your womb. What is impossible with men is possible with God. God's way is that you trust him, believe that he will answer you. 
He expects us to give thanks in advance. It calls for trusting God's word and trusting that he is faithful no matter what. God wants us in faith to give thanks and trust that he will not fail. In Philippians 4, 6, his word says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In other words, stop wasting your time and energy worrying about that problem. Spend your energy building your faith in God. Don't waste your time complaining about your troubles. The Israelites murmured and complained when they were in the wilderness. The Lord had brought them out from captivity in Egypt, but they felt that God had brought them from a bad situation to an even worse situation. They wanted the comfort of Egypt. They wasted their time complaining because they could not see the promised land. And that's how they missed their promise. In Numbers 14, 20 through 23, the Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me 10 times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Remember that just like some of the Israelites, you could easily miss the answer to your prayer because of complaining, because of doubt. But when you thank God before you see your prayer answered, it shows God trust in him, just like Joshua and Caleb. It shows that you know that he's listening and he will make a way where there seems to be no way. It shows that you believe that there's nothing too hard for God and that he will give you victory. You see, giving thanks is your way of saying, God, I believe that you have heard me. God, I believe that you have answered me. A story is told of a centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant who was far away from where Jesus was. Jesus offered to go to where his servant was and heal him. But the centurion was a man of faith. He understood that Jesus had authority over his situation. He understood that Jesus was powerful and was able to heal his servant just by saying a word. In Matthew 8:13, then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. Because he believed, he told Jesus that he didn't need to go where his servant was. The centurion understood that God's word is an authority, and when he speaks, his authority is final. He knew that his servant was healed. Will it be easy to say thank you when your situation is so difficult? Maybe not, but say thank you anyway. Will you want to cry out to God until you see your miracle? Yes, and there's nothing wrong with that because God is your father. But God is saying to you that as you cry to him, remember to give him thanks. As you wait on him in prayer about a situation, give thanks. Our nature may be to panic. Human beings tend to worry, to be anxious about things that we're not able to control. So you have to speak to yourself. When your thoughts start drifting towards worry, you have to say, nope, I am not going to worry today. And what should you do instead? With thanksgiving, present your request to God. That's what the word of God says. Thank him, cast your burdens to him. Thank him because you even know what he will or will not do for you. Give thanks in advance. And in a miraculous way, something begins to change inside of you. When you start to thank him for that job or that child or that house, the dark cloud hanging over your head starts to lift. As you give thanks in advance, your faith starts to get stronger. You start to hope again. You start to see God in a different light because thanking him in advance requires you to believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Thanking him in advance will require you to believe that he is faithful. And you know what? God cannot fail you. It's not his nature. 
He cannot deny himself. He is faithful through the ages. 2 Timothy 2.13 tells us that if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. He's not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. You can thank him in advance because as sure as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, he will answer your prayers. He won't give you a stone when you ask for bread, and he won't give you a snake when you ask for a fish. So go ahead and thank him now before you see your answered prayer. Does it mean your answer will come instantly? Is it a way to arm twist God to give you what you want? Certainly not. In fact, many times God's timing is not our timing. He does his work on a different clock. You may have to wait a while, just like Abraham and Sarah waited for their son Isaac. They waited 25 years from the time God promised a son to Abraham to the time when Isaac was born. In this age of automation, convenience, fast food, instant this and instant that, waiting can be the most difficult thing. You wanna see results immediately. You may feel like God is taking too long, like he's not fully aware that you're running out of time. But you need to know that God is not running late on his appointment with you. He's never late. He can't be late because he's perfect in all his ways. In Isaiah 46.10, his word says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. His purpose for your life will come to pass, no matter how impossible it seems to you right now. His timing is perfect. See, God has the full picture. While we can only see this moment we're in, He is carefully putting the pieces of the puzzle in your life together. He knows the best time to bring that miracle to pass. He can see how and when it will fit perfectly in your life. Keep an attitude of gratitude and wait. Trust in his timing. He knows exactly what he's doing and hasn't forgotten about you. Mary and Martha called on Jesus when their brother Lazarus was sick. They waited for Jesus, who was not too far away from where they were. They watched their brother get more and more sick until Lazarus eventually died, and it looked like it was over for them. They thought Jesus was too late, and they wrapped up their brother's body as was custom and put Lazarus in a tomb. A lot might have been going on in their minds. Why, Jesus? Where were you when we called? Are we not important to you? All the while, Jesus was not far away. He was only a few miles from where Lazarus was, but he was waiting for the appointed time to heal Lazarus, that God may be glorified. Jesus hadn't forgotten Martha and Mary's request. He wasn't sitting somewhere trying to make his schedule work so he could come see Lazarus. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. For us, when the situation looks impossible, We think it's also impossible for God. And like Mary, we're saying to the Lord, Lord, if you would have been there, my brother wouldn't have died. Lord, if you would have been there, I wouldn't have lost my marriage or that job or that child. And just like Jesus was deeply moved by Mary's sorrow, he is deeply moved by your sorrow. He knows you've been praying and waiting. He knows you may be weary and almost giving up. In John 11:39, having given up, Martha had many reasons, excuses why the tomb should not be open, and they were valid reasons. The man had been dead four days. The tomb was going to have a foul smell. Jesus said to Mary, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And God is saying to you today that if you believe, if you keep thanking him, if you wait for his perfect timing, you will see his glory through your situation. He can make your dead situation live again. He will heal. He will restore. He will deliver. God is for you and not against you. He's fighting your battles. He's fighting for you. Sometimes it takes a while to see our prayers answered because there's a battle that has to be won in the heavens. Daniel 
a faithful servant of God, had to wait for his answer. He prayed, but the Bible says his angel was delayed by a battle. The Bible records that the prince of the kingdom of Persia had detained the angel for 21 days. As Daniel kept praying, as he kept waiting, Satan tried to stop Daniel's answer from getting to him, but God sent angel Michael to fight the demons. And the end of it all, God won the battle for Daniel. You may have to wait because there is a battle in the heavens, but fear not. God will win the battle for you too. Keep praying, stay on your knees, wait on him until something happens. Thanking him always in advance, waiting for God's perfect timing. Many are the times we find ourselves blaming people for the things that happen to us. A day might not pass before you hear someone say, were it not for this person, I would have done this. I would be this. If so-and-so had not done this, then this would not have happened. We blame people because they kept us and made us miss the bus. We blame people because they did not tell us our kids were crossing the road, and so they got hit. We blame people for not reminding us the deadline was due, and so we submitted our assignments past time. We endlessly say if this person had done this, then this would or would not have happened. Now, is there any justification in that? The much the Bible says concerning this is telling us to be our brothers and sisters keepers. It does not tell us to rely on others to have our lives orderly. The Bible encourages us to take care of others, but it discourages us from making ourselves other people's responsibility. In Jeremiah 17.5, the Bible says, Cursed is the man who puts their trust in man who draws strength from mere flesh. Why do you look up to a fellow man to do for you things you should be asking from God? If your trust is in man, the Bible calls you cursed. God is the one we should look up to, because whatever he says and does is not subject to human approval. If you are qualified by God, no man can disqualify you. If you are an appointed of God, no one can disappoint you. God is the only one with the final say over our lives, so it's Him we should seek counsel from. We should ask for advice from the Spirit of God. When we are in a dilemma and we need advice, we should rely on the Spirit of God to help us. Why do you wait for someone to compliment you? Why must you wait and feel for someone to say you are beautiful? In as much time when people say nice things about us, we feel good? That it is not where we should base our self-esteem on. Our focus should be on what God says about us. And he says that he created us in his own image and likeness. God says that you look like him. He says that you are wonderfully and beautifully made. Quit seeking approval from men. People will disappoint you. They will leave you bitter. They'll make you feel undeserving of anything good in this world. If you listen to the voices of the world, you will find yourself with a lot of unnecessary information. Do not rely on people. Stop depending on friends and family members. Make it a habit to have your ways guided by God. Because only God can never forget, abandon, or forsake us. He says in Isaiah that even though a mother may forget a baby she has born, he will never forget us. Isaiah 49.15 People will love you when there is something in offer for them. They will be willing to help, but in exchange for something from you. Your boss might be willing to give you a promotion, but not before you give him some favors. Your lecturer might give you the high scores you crave, but it won't be for nothing. Your deskmate will reserve you a seat at the front row, but in return you will do something else for her. That's how people are. The there are no free things principle is what governs most human relationships. It might not apply to you, but it may apply to the people you interact with. There is real danger in relying on people. It is risky to put your trust in man, who is there today and is gone tomorrow just like the grass of the field. 
Isaiah 2.22 says, Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why should you trust in a mere mortal, yet you have the privilege to trust in God, who is eternal? If it is God who establishes the plans of man, wouldn't it be wiser to trust him than to trust in fellow men? Unless the Lord builds the house, the builder labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the guards stand watch in vain. Psalm 127.1 This verse speaks on how useless it is to trust in men. They tell us that God is the only one who is capable of making our plans come to pass. If no man can control even a small percentage of their life, how about being entrusted with the lives of other people? If your trust is in men, you will be disappointed. If all you relay is on a mere mortal like you, you are in for a great shock. People will always be people. They will pretend to love us for the benefit that come with it. Other people will deny you certain opportunities simply because they don't like you. But if you trust in God and ask for anything by faith, then it will be done. God never disappoints. Psalm 37.25 says, I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. Even when you're in a bad situation, trust in God. Do not rely on people to help you out. Put your total dependency on God. He will get you out of the situation. Psalm 9.10 says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. People lie. People betray. People give up. People get tired. People lose interest. But God never does. He has never and he will never. He is not a man that he should lie. God does not betray. He does not tire at helping us out when we cry unto him. He can never lose interest in us. He is always on the lookout for us to ensure we are well. God is always there for us. He is the only one we should depend. Do not depend on anyone to cheer you up. Do not make anyone the source of your happiness. Do not wait for anyone to provide you with all what you need. Trust in God to give you the desires of your heart. Only God cannot take advantage of your needs. It is only God that cannot go spilling your secrets to anyone. It is only God who knows what he has in store for us. Therefore, if we trust in him, we have the assurance that no matter what happens, he always has our back. Psalm 121, 1-2 I lift up my eyes and look onto the mountains. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. So pick yourself up. Your worth is not dependent on what people say or do not say. You're not beautiful because someone said so, but because that is what God says. People might make you feel inferior, you can prove them wrong. People might despise you. You can make yourself feel good about you. People might try to bring you down. You can uplift your You can uplift yourself. You might not be so important to them, but to God you are of great value. People may not cheer you up when you need it the most, but think of God as your biggest cheerleader. When no one seems to notice the efforts you've made, cheer yourself up. Tell yourself that you can do all things through Christ. Why? Because the Bible says so. Because you are a child of God. Because you got your help from above. People might not take you to be special to them, but remember that you can make yourself feel special because that's how God sees you. He even has your name written on his palm, just to show you how special you are. If you put your trust in man, you will be disappointed. 
When Jesus was arrested, he lacked even one friend that could stand by him during that period. Out of the twelve that had been with him during his ministry, none was willing. Peter, who had promised to always be with him, denied him in front of everyone. And that's the nature of human beings. To support us when things are going well, and when they're out of control, leaving us to solve them on our own. People will be there for you at first, but with time they get bored and leave. They will not hold your hand from the beginning to the end like God can. They will not supply your needs without problem like God can. Nobody will get you out of trouble countless times like God can. No one will give their lives up for you or that of their dear one for you like God did. Only few people, if any, will help you out of genuine concern. Put your trust in God. Stop relying on mere mortal human beings. Look up on the hills, for that is where your help will come from. If anything that you do, trust in God rather than relying on people. If you want to further your studies, trust in God that he will provide you with fees. If you want to start a business, trust in God that you will get the capital. If you are sick and seeking healing, Take medicine and accompany them with prayer, because God is your healer. Do not give people too much reverence in your life, such that they take the place of God. Remember that they are creation, just like yourself. It is the Creator, not the creation, who is to be worshipped and trusted. The Bible says that those who put their trust in God shall never be disappointed. They shall. Stop seeking the validation and approval of men. Believe in whatever God says about you and your life. The praise and honor people give is temporary. Their happiness over your success is short-lived. They're only happy on the outside, but deep inside, they are genuinely happy. They will be happy when things are good, but disappear once we are in need of their help. If Jesus had relied on support from his disciples to make it through what had happened to him, he would have lost it. But since he relied on God, Jesus overcame. It was God that gave him the strength. That is what we should all desire. To call ourselves blessed even when people curse us. To always be happy even when people disappoint us. To say to ourselves, we can do it even when no one believes us. To rely fully on the promises of God. To feed directly of his word. Not to listen to the voices of the world. God wants us to stop relying on people and to trust in him alone. Start today. A. Failures are stepping stones to success. When you fail, that's not the end. It's simply the realization of an opportunity to grow. Failure is the world's programmed discouragement to get you to stop. Because no one can fail if they don't stop. If you keep at it, there's no way you won't succeed. Once upon a time, when all humans lived together and spoke one language, God said, There is nothing that they set to accomplish that they won't. And that's the fact about man God created. Unfortunately, we have been programmed with a limitation. Failure. Failure begins from the mindset. How you see it. As an excuse to retire, pack your bag and go home. Or as an opportunity to forge ahead. Failure is only failure when you quit. It is not a failure until you give up. What many call failure is actually temporary weaknesses and shortcomings that expose room for improvement. Failure is like a mirror that reveals the dirty spots in your face so you could wipe them off. Failure directly and indirectly reveals the next step to achieving your goals. When you give up, when you quit, you have truly failed. That means if you have stayed and kept pushing, you haven't failed. In school, we were taught objective failure. 
when you score below a set grading standard, you failed. And as a result, you get punished, either by repeating the school year or get frowned at or grounded by your parents. In life, failure is subjective. It's no longer about the failure itself, but how you see the failure. What did you fail in? What standards did you come short at? If life were to be a restaurant, you cannot choose between failure and success. You will be served failure again and again and again and again. Failure is the door to success. Failure is the steps you must take to your desired destination. Remember the story of David, a classic example of how failure is the doorway to success. David was the least in the sons of Jesse. He was the smallest in class, the least performing student, the least performing manager, the businessman running at a loss, the losing politician. He was everything failure. Failure was written all over him. That was David. David was not doing well, so he was given the least task to do. He was made to shepherd sheep in the desert where fierce wild animals were. He was young, small, but he was sent into the wilderness to have sheep as his companions because obviously he was irrelevant. His life does not really matter to Jesse, his father, so they couldn't care less. He was that irrelevant. Such that when God sent Samuel to Jesse's family in the search of a king to replace Saul, Jesse literally forgot that there was a son he had forgotten in the wilderness. He forgot David. David was such a big failure that his father forgot him. This same David was the one who killed Goliath, the same Goliath that his so-called more successful brothers ran away from. The same David killed a lion and bear in the wilderness. Same David was anointed by prophet Samuel as the next king of Israel. David's story of failure did not stop there. David was such a massive failure, he ruined the good thing he had in the king's palace. He became King Saul's sworn enemy. He had to run away for his life. He was in exile for years and became the leaders of never-do-wells, failures like himself. He made those never-do-wells into mighty warriors, giant slayers in fact. David became the forefather of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. David was a man who stood with God's word. He kept God's word in his heart. He knew God's plan for him and he never gave up, even in the face of plenty challenges. David arguably faced the greatest challenges in the Bible, but David stood strong through it all. David never gave up. David stayed with God's word because he knew that failure is never the final. His failures were his badges. The story of David is not complete today without those failures. Your failure is not your end, but a process you must pass through to become the person God wants you to be. It's not possible to become insanely successful without ever failing. If success were a house, no matter how brilliant you think you are, you can't tiptoe past failure on the way to success. Failure is the front door. In life, failure is the currency of success. This is not a question of innate talent. You're not better or smarter than failure. You're not above it and you can't escape it. You're going to fail many times, probably more than you succeed. But there is good news. What we often consider to be a failure isn't a failure at all. It's an opportunity to learn why you failed, what you did that led to failing, or what you can do to better next time. This information you obtain from failures is like a currency you earn through the courage of taking action. The more times you fail, the more knowledgeable you become and the closer you are to achieving your goals. From this perspective, failure and mistakes shouldn't be avoided. They should be welcomed, embraced, cherished. If you want to achieve anything worthwhile, you have to let go of the idea that failure is something to avoid. Nobody wants to fail but you have to be willing to fail if you ever want the chance to succeed. This acceptance and anticipation of failure weakens its sting and helps you regain perspective to get back on track, although you could even argue that failure is the track. 
Think of it this way. You win or you learn. And you win by learning. When you've finally accumulated enough failures, you might have the chance to exchange your fortune of failures for a tiny bit of success. Of course, simply failing doesn't mean you'll succeed. But if you invest your failures wisely, you'll have much a better shot. In Genesis chapter 38, Tamar failed and yes, she failed more than once. Because what else is a failure if not having to bury your first and second husband, who were brothers, and Judah, the father of the two sons, was too afraid to give you his third son. He thought the third son might die too. She became a widow. For years she was abandoned. She became a laughingstock. She was a typical example of failure. But she never gave up. She knew her right and gave birth to twins by Judah himself. She later became the foremother of King David and our Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at Jephthah today, with human eyes, we see a classic failure, son of a prostitute, a bastard. But God saw a mighty warrior, a righteous man, and the one who would save the Israelites from their enemies. We were taught early about failure and it was reinforced by several things. Nobody taught us that being alive alone is success. We survived a one in a billion odds to be alive. That's a huge success. We were tricked to believe that failure is the end and that it was only success if we got it the first time. The seed dies before it grows. Most seeds grow downwards into the soil before sprouting up. To us, we think the seed was failing or has failed because it died or because it's moving down deeper into the soil. Remember that trees with the deepest roots are the strongest and the biggest. They are the strongest against wind and storm. But so you know that trees with the deepest roots take the longest time to grow. This means they were failures compared to the faster growing trees. It all begins with thoughts thoughts that you have when you are alone, your most prevalent thoughts on success or failure. Are you confident of God's help? Words are instrumental to your thoughts and that's why you should keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The word of God is the assurance that keeps you going. The feeling of failure can be depressing unlike success which excites and makes you happy and spirit lifted. But failure is a necessary evil. Although now you know that this is not evil but good. I've failed many times than I could count, but I also know that every time I failed, I was launched into another stage of awareness of new possibilities. Yes, it wasn't palatable, but it would have been worse if I had stopped as a result. It takes strength to see through the treasures hidden inside failure. It takes so much strength to see through lack of immediate desires, pain, hunger, disappointments, low grades, job layoffs, business crashes, investment loss, and so many misfortunes that happened to us due to some inadequacies of unforeseen events. These are truly painful experiences, and that's why you must allow God's strength to keep you going, even in the face of challenges. Just like the psalmist, say to yourself, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. God is my refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Rest on God's abundant strength. Learn from your failures and never give up on God's plan for your life. Never give up on your dreams. Failure will come. Yes, it will. But now you know, failure is a major ingredient of success. Most failures aren't real. They are perceived. Because we are emotional creatures, we allow our emotions to get the best part of us. So you perceive every slight mistake or error as a failure. 
you perceive an uncontrollable catastrophe as a failure. Failure is only truly a failure. If you expect that you should always and immediately be succeeding every step along the way. Not only is that wrong, but it's also impossible. There's an entitlement to success that looms large at both a societal and personal level. We not only expect to be amazing at whatever we touch, but we expect to be amazing right now, regardless of the amount of work or sacrifice we put in. Those who are willing to fail and view mistakes as boosts along the timeline of their own development are more likely to succeed than those who consider those same mistakes as indicative of their identity, worth, or natural inability. Because in the end, it's not about you. It's about the timeline, your patience, discipline, and willingness to make even the most frustrating mistakes over and over again in the name of progress. Failure is not the opposite of success, no. The opposite of success is not trying. And that's the real failure. When you give up, when you stop showing up, that's the failure by avoidance. And that kind of failure wrecks, not good. But the other kind of failure is failure by courage, failure by doing, failure by moving forward. Now that's some good failure. Although not really a failure, there are necessary steps you must take forward. That's why it's called failing forward. So keep failing your way to success. Fail, get back up, learn, try again, fail again, get back up. Learn and then try again and try again and try again and fail again and succeed. Just like King David, your story is not complete without failures. The failures are your fires that refine you to become the best version of yourself. In all of these, remember God's promise to you. For though the righteous fall seven times, they will rise again.